The Marauder of Kampekarai by Kenneth Anderson Recording by Apratim Viraj Singh If you try to imagine two parallel ranges of lofty hills, averaging 4,000 feet and more above the sea, with a valley between them about five miles across, covered with dense forest except for the craggy summits, you will have in your mind's eye the background of my story. It is set in the North Salem district of the Presidency of Madras in southern India. The hills run from north to south, and the easterly range is the more lofty of the two, culminating at its southern point in the peak of Guthrian, which is over 4,500 feet high. On its slopes stands a lovely little forest lodge known as Kodekarai Bungalow, amidst some of the finest scenery in the world. Rolling hills and jutting cliffs are to be seen in every direction. The sun rises in shades of rose pink above the billowing clouds of morning mist, to set eventually in orange-bronze reflections behind the western range. Then the moon comes up in pallid splendor, tipping the hilltops and later the deep valleys with her luminous wand. Through the night she rides the heavens, silent witness of many a jungle tragedy in the dark forests below. The scream of a dying samphar or the shrill shriek of a spotted stag have often gone forth in vain to that same full moon as they spilled their lifeblood on the forest floor beneath the paws of a hungry tiger. More than twenty years ago, I had the honor of meeting the brother of King Amanullah of Afghanistan, who was exiled from his native country and lived at Kodikarai Bungalow, which was his favorite abode. He told me that he loved the place, that its scenery reminded him of his beloved Afghanistan, except that the hills of Kodikarai were forest-clad while those of his country were bare. But both of them exemplified space and freedom. Kempekarai is a small hamlet standing on the lower slopes of the western range. Around it lie a few fields, and beyond the fields, the forest of dense bamboo, intersected by a rocky stream that flows down the center of the valley. This valley, which I called Spider Valley, because of the immense spiders that spin their webs across the narrow footpath that runs beside the stream, broadens out towards the south into a larger tract known as the Murappur Valley, where the rocky stream finally joins the Chinar River at a spot called Sopathi, some ten miles from the Kaveri River. I have described the area at some length so that the reader may, with a little imagination, share the stirring incidents of this story and savor for a few minutes its lavish beauty. The dank smell of rotting vegetation, the twilight of a dense jungle, the distant half-roar, half-moan of a man-eating tiger searching for its prey, the eerie and deathly silence that follows those thrilling calls, and finally that faint rustle in the undergrowth, the indefinable creeping something that is the man-eater, watching as he becomes aware of your presence, and pits the age-old hunting skill of its kind against the civilized intellect of man. But let me begin my story. Kempekarai was in a state of great fear, for a man-eating tiger had appeared, and three of its few inhabitants had already gone to fill his bill of fare. The first victim, an old Pujari, had left Muthur eleven miles away to come to Kampekarai one month ago. He was never seen again. Elephants infest these areas, and very occasionally kill men. So when the Pujari failed to arrive at Kampekarai, a search party set out towards Muthur. Perhaps the men who composed it expected to come upon the plate-like spoor of an elephant, and to find the squashed remains. But they found neither. About five miles from Kampekarai, they did come upon the tracks of a male tiger, a little blood by the path side, the old man's staff and his loin cloth, and nothing more. Some ten days later, a woman went down to the community well near sunset to fill her water pot for the night. She never returned. At 8 p.m., her husband and some of his friends, carrying lanterns and staves, visited the well to look for her. The brass water pot, half filled with water, lay on its side some twenty feet from the well, where it had been dropped by the woman on her return to the village. Of her, there was no trace. Next morning, a search party was instituted, 
which duly came across the woman's sari, later a silver anklet, and finally her remains. Her head lay under a bush. Her hands and feet were scattered about. Of the remainder of her body, a goodly number of gnawed bones showed the tiger had indeed been hungry and had done full justice to a succulent repast. A month dragged by. Kempekarai assumed the air of a fortress besieged. Nobody came in, and nobody went out. The immediate precincts, and in some cases interiors of the few huts, stank with human filth. Was there not a killer nearby, waiting for the first victim who was bold enough to even venture outside to answer the call of nature? The matter was particularly perilous at night. Human beings, with their cattle and sometimes their dogs, were barricaded together within their cramped huts, behind doors that were kept shut with logs of wood or rounded boulders from the stream. The huts became more filthy every day, under the force of the terrible circumstances in which the people were placed. But the very best of precautions sometimes fall short of attaining their desired results. Mara, one of the son-in-law of my old friend Baira the Pujari, had spurned to live in such insanitary conditions. He had told his wife that, man-eating tiger or not, he for one would not soil the inside of his house. Nightly he had gone outside to answer the calls of nature, and nightly he had returned. Then one night he went out as usual for the same purpose, but this time he did not return. His wife, anxiously waiting inside, admits she heard a dull thud, a rasping gurgle, but nothing more. After fifteen minutes she raised the alarm. Nobody would come to her rescue, for nobody dared. The inhabitants of the barricaded huts heard her shrieks for help. They knew that by this time Mara was beyond human assistance. He was dead, but they were alive. What was the use of going outside to join him among the dead? So they remained indoors and listened to her screaming for the remainder of that long night. Next morning, a half-hearted attempt was made to find what was left of Mara and it would have been unsuccessful, but that the tiger had boldly eaten his fill among the bushes within two hundred yards of the village. A little more was left of Mara than had been left of the woman who had gone to the well. Perhaps his flesh was tougher, or perhaps the tiger was less hungry. Who knows? His head and torso, at least, were still in one piece. Because of the fate that had befallen his son-in-law, my old friend Baira, who happened to be at Kempekarai at that time, undertook the hazardous eighteen-mile journey to the village of Penagram next day. He came by himself, as nobody would accompany him, and made the journey without sight or sound of the man-eater. At Penagram he sought out his old acquaintance, Ranga, and the two of them came by bus to Bangalore. At nine p.m. that night voices called me to the front door, and going outside, I was surprised, but delighted to see my old jungle companions once more. The Salem district had, meanwhile, adopted prohibition as a guiding policy towards physical, moral, and, no doubt, spiritual uplift. But my two visitors, being simple, honest, forest folk, with no such high physical, moral, or spiritual pretensions, enjoyed a shot of good spirits, in the form of half a tumbler of neat brandy each. Thus refreshed, they began at the beginning, or rather Baira did, and related the brief history of the coming and doings of the man-eater, as I have told it to you, closing with the flat statement that his son-in-law, Mara, must be avenged, and that I was to do it. In the face of that argument, and his childlike confidence in me, I could find no very convincing reply. Three days later, I was on the road to Penagram, where I left the Studebaker. We bought supplies at the local market, and within a few hours the three of us were trudging those eighteen miles to the little hamlet of Kempekarai where the car could not go. A couple of miles before our destination we found fresh pug marks of a tiger on the footpath. No human travellers had passed along this track for many days, and the spoor was clear. I made careful measurements and noted the pugs belonged to a male tiger of average size. This gave no indication whether the maker was an old animal or of normal adult age, nor could any of us say at that time whether he was the man-eater or just another passing tiger. 
The few inhabitants of Kempekarai were unable to add much material information to that which had already been given to me by Baira. They thought the man-eater was an enormous animal. But of course, all simple folk, when keyed up to a state of sheer terror, bordering on panic, as had been the case with these poor people for the past few weeks, are given to attributing superhuman cunning and wholly impossible bodily strength and size to their oppressor. The problem now was how to proceed and what to do. The answer was wait for a kill or present a live bait. This particular tiger had not killed a single cow or other domestic animal belonging to the villagers. So far, at least, it had killed only human beings. The question was, would it kill an animal bait, or should that bait be human? To which the only answer was that in the event of a human bait it could be nobody but myself, an answer which I thoroughly disliked even to think about. Baira, Ranga, and myself went into close conference over successive mugs of tea, and eventually an answer began to take shape. I thought we should try animal baits, but they thought a human bait, myself of course, would produce immediate results. I heartily wished they had reached a different conclusion. In a three-man committee, any two of them form an overwhelming majority. The odd man must give in, but I managed to force my point to the extent of agreeing that, together with the human bait, there would be no harm in tying out a couple of young bullocks at selected spots as an additional attraction. No buffaloes were available at Kampekarai, so I bought two bullocks, one of which we tied at the spot where we had found the pug marks, and the other on the bed of the stream that meandered along the bottom of the valley. I sat on the stone parapet wall of the well my back resting against one of the wooden uprights that supported the pulley wheel, through which ran a rope for drawing water. I arranged for a metal pot to be tied to the end of this rope, which I kept beside me on the parapet wall. Fresh water is always nicer to drink than that from a water bottle. The jungle began some fifty yards from the well in all directions, except one. Here, Somebody had planted a dozen or more papaya trees. With the occasional watering from the well that these trees received, an undergrowth, mainly of grass with a few shrubs here and there, had sprung up around the papaya trees. In daylight, this undergrowth appeared negligible, but with twilight and approaching darkness, I began to feel it presented an admirable line of approach for the man-eater, which could easily crawl through it on its belly and come within almost springing distance of where I sat without my being aware of its presence. When this thought came to my mind, I changed my position to the other side of the well, using the opposite wooden upright as a backrest so that I now faced the papayas. I had only decided to expose myself in view of the fact that we had fortunately come at a time just before full moon. Moonrise almost synchronized with sunset, but I had forgotten that the moon still had to top the range of hills to the east before it could cast its brilliance on that benighted well. This would only happen after 8 p.m., and I spent one of the worst ninety minutes of my life awaiting. I cannot hope to express how eagerly and anxiously the first rays of that longed-for moon. The experience brought me back to the terrible hours I had spent before the huts of Gumalapur awaiting that horrid panther, and to the day I had sat with my back to the teak tree in the far distant Chamala forest range hoping for a glimpse of a similar man-eater, and I wondered what had made me so foolish as once again to place myself in such an awkward predicament then common sense told me that perhaps it was the only way. The darkness was deathly still, and not even the familiar night jar came anywhere near me. A few bats flitted down the well to sip the limpid water in a series of flying kisses as they quenched their thirst after the hot day. I strained my eyes, not only towards the papaya trees, but also in all directions. Imagination created the form of the man-eater, slowly creeping, stealthily stalking me from just outside my range of vision. I sat glued to the parapet wall, my point four zero five cocked, my thumb on the torch switch. 
The thoughts that spring to a man's mind at such times are often strange and unaccountable. But why should I burden you with them? The tiger first assumed the role of a possible avenging fate. At other times, it practically faded from conscious thought. Shortly after eight o'clock, the skyline above the eastern range grew more distinct. A pale glow diffused itself against the sky, dimming the stars, and then the moon appeared, lightening both the surroundings and my nervous condition. As the moon rose higher in the heavens, the scene became brighter, until I could see almost clearly between the stems of the papaya trees. Not a sound disturbed the silence of my vigil for practically the first half of the night. Shortly after 11 p.m., a sambhar stag voiced its strident call from the bed of the stream where I had tied one of my bullocks. I recognized the note of alarm and fear in its voice. As the call was repeated over and over again to die away at last in the distance, when the stag ascended the rampart of the opposing range of hills to safety. Again silence fell, and the night dragged out its last hours. It then struck me that I might perhaps be able to catch the tiger's acute hearing, if he was anywhere within a mile, by operating the pulley wheel above the well, which, I had noticed earlier in the afternoon, creaked and squealed loudly as it revolved around its uncoiled axle. Perhaps he would hear and be attracted, thinking another prospective victim was drawing water from the well. So I went around the well to where the water pot rested on the ground. First of all, I stood the firearm up against the wall, and then let the pot down until it touched the water, drawing it up and letting it down in slow succession thereafter. The pulley screeched loudly in the silence of the night and I continued for nearly an hour, stopping every now and then to survey my surroundings intently, particularly the deep shadows cast by every bush. But nothing stirred, and in the breathless air not a leaf moved, nor did even a belated rat rustle the dried debris that carpeted the ground beneath the adjacent papayas. To all intents and purposes, I was the only living thing in that area apart from the inmates of the huts secure behind barricaded doors. After 3 a.m., the moon began to sink behind the western range of hills, and the same conditions presented themselves as in the previous evening. It grew darker and darker, and soon I could only see a few yards around me, and that by the radiance of the stars that came to life and twinkled overhead with the disappearance of the setting sun. There were only ninety minutes of darkness left, and I felt terribly sleepy. Still, I had now to redouble my guard. Had I not been trying to attract the tiger for the past hour? As he had not passed that way all night, it was just possible he might do so now. Moreover, conditions for a surprise attack were all in his favor, as the papaya trees themselves now became undefined except as a darker blur among the other shadows in my line of vision. I realized that the man-eater had me completely at his mercy if he chose to attack. Should he roar as he charged, I could at least discharge my rifle at point-blank range. On the other hand, if he crept silently upon me, I would not be aware of his coming until actually struck down. At the same time, all the rats and rabbits and other small animals, which had been conspicuous by their absence all night, appeared to select this moment to rendezvous near the well. They scurried hither and thither, and rustled the dead leaves, sometimes noisily, sometimes barely audibly, while my excited imagination telegraphed the urgent message, The man-eater is coming. Altogether, I had a dreadful time. The false dawn came and went, and then at 5.45 a.m., the brightening of the skyline once more above the eastern range told me that daylight was at last at hand and that the tedious vigil was nearly over. It was well past seven before the sun peeped over the eastern hills, and I arose and dragged my weary, sleepy steps to the tent I had pitched at the southern end of the village. Hot tea and a nap till 10.30 a.m. Then, accompanied by Ranga and Baira, I first visited the bait, tethered in the stream bed. It was alive and well. 
Closer inspection showed that a tiger had approached to within 15 feet of it and had passed on after a cursory inspection. The Sambhur stag I had heard during the night had doubtless seen or scented this tiger and had voiced his loud alarm. The tiger's pug marks were clearly indicated in the soft, dry sand, but they could not be identified as having been made by the same animal as had those I had seen while coming along the path on the western range, where the ground was firmer and dimensions not exaggerated. Nevertheless, I had little doubt that this was the real man-eater, for a normal tiger will not readily leave a tempting, unguarded bait alive. We then went to see the other bullock, where a surprise awaited us. It had been killed by a tiger whose pug marks were identical with those I had carefully measured the previous day near the very same spot on the pathway. The question now was this. Were there two tigers in the vicinity, or had the second bullock been killed by the man-eater? If the latter was the case, and there was only one tiger, and that the man-eater, why had he not killed the bullock which had been tied in the stream bed instead of just looking at it and choosing to kill the other? I formed the definite opinion that there were two tigers in the vicinity, and that it had been the man-eater which had ignored the bullock at the stream. Ranga agreed with me, but Baira would not commit himself to either opinion. He suggested that the man-eater might be the only tiger in the area, and that it had not killed the first bullock, possibly because it was a white one. The second, being dark brown, had been above suspicion. On the question of the color of a live bait, I have a very open mind. In my own experience, color makes little or no difference to a tiger, and he will kill your bait, provided certain other conditions also exist. He must be hungry, for a tiger rarely, if ever, kills wantonly. Moreover, he must not suspect a trap of any kind. In these days, when tiger hunting is becoming intensified, tigers are learning their bitter lessons quickly. Nature makes an effort to try to preserve a species which is rapidly becoming shot out. Thus, a bait secured around the neck by a rope stands a very good chance of not being touched by a tiger. He cannot reason, but his instinct or sense of self-preservation tells him that it is unnatural for villagers to tie up their cattle for the night in a forest. A bait, secured by a rope, tied around the horns, stands more chance of being killed, for it is possible for an animal to get entangled in the undergrowth by its horns. A bait, secured by its hind leg, is also readily taken. The main point to be remembered is that both tigers and panthers attack the throats of their victims, and there should therefore be no visible obstruction to prevent this method of attack, or the attacker becomes suspicious. Panthers are generally less careful than tigers in this respect, and take greater risks. Personally, I dislike tethering dogs as bait for a panther. I feel the practice is extremely cruel, for the dog is a very sagacious animal and knows well the purpose for which he is being tied. This being so, he must suffer terrible mental torture till his attacker arrives. When I was younger, and, I must confess, had fewer scruples, I tried to salve my conscience by protecting the dog's life. To achieve this, I made a collar, about four inches broad, using two pieces of leather, with numerous two-inch-long sharpened nails in close array, protruding outwards, the heads of the nails coming between the two strips of leather. It would amuse me, in those bygone days, to watch the panther grab at the dog's throat, only to spring backwards in obvious dismay as the sharp nails pierced his mouth. Before he could solve the puzzle, of course, he was shot. But such elementary tricks cannot be played on a tiger. Tying up a sickly live bait is also fatal to success. The Badaga tribe, who inhabit the Nilgiri mountains, are very averse to selling healthy animals for bait, no matter what price is offered for them. They feel it is a sin to sacrifice the life of a good bullock. Invariably, they will offer only a sickly animal whose days are numbered, anyhow, for this purpose. I well remember tying up a bullock in the last stages of foot-and-mouth disease. 
For three nights in succession, as tracks in the sand revealed, the tiger came to the spot, walked around the bait, even squatted before it, and then decided it was too diseased to kill. On the fourth night, my son sat up over the sick animal, but by eight o'clock its allotted span of time was running out. It collapsed and took the whole night to die. That night, the tiger did not even appear. Hunters of experience vary in their opinions regarding the color of a live bait, and I have met a few who avoid using white animals, either cattle or goats, because they claim that these are the least likely to be taken. A famous panther hunter of days gone by, who had shot over a hundred panthers, was very averse to tying up a black goat, which, he claimed, made the panther extra wary in its approach. I have digressed at some length on these points, as I feel many of you who read these stories will be interested to learn what might be called some aspects of the technique of tiger and panther shooting. In drawing room circles, we often hear of the extraordinary degree of good luck that attends a certain shikari or big game hunter. Actually, much of this good luck is due to his previous experience of the innumerable factors that combine to make or mar a successful hunt. Returning to my story, there was obviously only one thing to do, and that was to fix a machan above the partly eaten brown bullock. Through experience, both our baits had been tethered near suitable trees, so while I went back to the tent for a further nap, Ranga and Baira, both highly qualified in such matters, made a good job of slinging up the canvas camp chair I had brought neatly folded with me. Next to a charpoy, or Indian rope cot, a folding chair makes a good machan. It is not nearly so comfortable or roomy as the charpoy, but has an advantage in being easily taken to pieces and folded up. Returning by 5 p.m., I took up my position, prepared for an all-night vigil. The pathway situated as it was on the western range above the village of Kampekarai, received the rays of the rising moon far earlier than did the village and the well where I had spent the previous night. So it was that, soon after the sun sank below the western hilltops, the moon peeped over the eastern range, and visibility was good all around me. Nothing happened till shortly after eight, when I became aware that the tiger stood directly beneath me. How or from where it had come, I never knew. Certainly not along the path which was clearly visible in both directions as it stretched away into the forest. I knew the tiger was below me by the soft noise it made as it rubbed its body against the trunk of the tree in which I was sitting, and in doing so looked up and became aware of my presence. Things then began to happen quickly. With a snarling growl, the tiger began at once to claw its way up the tree trunk. Fortunately, we had selected a tree with a fairly straight trunk till the first crotch was reached at about fifteen feet above the ground, where I was sitting on the camp chair. I knew that this was the man-eater, for normally a tiger would have decamped at once on becoming aware that a human being sat above him. Instinctively, I drew up both legs as high as possible, while leaning over the chair sideways and to the left to get in a shot. Unfortunately, I had leant in the wrong direction, for the tiger was trying to climb the tree on my right side. I quickly corrected myself, but now had to hold the rifle to my left shoulder. It took you longer to read the preceding two paragraphs than events actually took that night. As I have said, I was sitting about fifteen feet above the ground. A normal tiger is about nine feet long from nose tip to tail tip. Subtracting the length of its tail and adding something in compensation for an outstretched forepaw, we may come by a working figure of almost eight feet to cover the stretching range of a man-eater, or for that matter, of any tiger. Deducting these eight feet from the original height of fifteen feet, we get a difference of about seven feet, which was about the distance that tiger succeeded in climbing the tree trunk that night. In his eagerness to get hold of me, he stretched out a forepaw, and as the sharp claws drove through the canvas of the camp chair seat, and incidentally partially through my pants, the tiger lost his balance and fell backwards to earth, 
while instinctively, in my anxiety to protect my rear, I half levered myself out of the chair. I was lucky not to drop my rifle and follow in the wake of the tiger. Now, it is a peculiar fact about man-eaters, both tigers and panthers, that they appear to be craven creatures, although they attack and devour human beings. Almost without exception, such attacks are made from behind, and when the victim is not aware of the presence of his attacker. Very rarely, indeed, has any man-eater been known to carry out a frontal attack or rush a person who is aware of his presence and faces him. And so it was that night, for as he fell backwards to earth, the man-eater realized his presence had been disclosed, and no sooner had he landed on the ground than with a bound and a snarl he disappeared in the surrounding lantana. I cannot say to which of our good fortunes it was that he did so, for although I had now become aware of his presence and was prepared for him, I might easily have overbalanced or dropped the rifle in trying to get a downward shot at that very awkward angle directly below me. Be that as it may, he was gone in a flash, and as suddenly and as unexpectedly as he had come. My presence having been discovered, there was now no point in remaining motionless or silent. Reviewing the damage done, I discovered three claw marks through the canvas of the chair, each about five inches long, where the tiger's forepaw had swept. Of these, two had penetrated the seat of my pants, and myself inside them to a lesser extent. The flesh certainly smarted to remind me of the fact. Normally, the incident would evoke some mirth in the minds of mirthful people, but I would remind them that the claws of all carnivores are full of poisonous bacteria from the decomposed flesh at which they tear, and a man-eater is no exception to this rule, because the flesh happens to be human. The canvas of the chair and the cloth of my pants were not sufficiently thick to absorb all this poisonous material, so that there was some chance of my wound becoming infected. I had brought with me a variety of first aids, including a good stock of procaine, penicillin, and my 5cc hypodermic syringe, but all these were in my tent at Kampekurai, some two miles away. I had therefore to choose between returning immediately and taking medical precautions or remaining till morning, which was at least ten hours ahead, by which time the poison might have spread in the wounds. In the one case, I had to face the chance of attack by the man-eater, which might be launched anywhere along the path for the distance of the two miles it extended up to Kampekurai. On the other hand, I had to face the perhaps more certain danger of sepsis and a long period of incapacitation from pursuing the man-eater. And so I chose to risk the tiger as the lesser of the two evils, and quickly letting my rifle down on the rope brought for the purpose, I as quickly scrambled down myself, praying fervently that the man-eater would not choose that very moment for a second attack. Reaching the ground, I stood with my back to the tree trunk, while I freed the rifle from the rope by which I had lowered it down. All was as silent as the grave, and not a sound came from any part of the forest to give me any indication of the whereabouts of my recent attacker. For all intents and purposes, he might be ten miles away or behind the nearest bush. The brilliant moonlight bathed the jungle in its ethereal glow, making visible each leaf and grass blade as they gracefully vibrated to the soft currents of the night breezes that gently wafted the scent of night flowers along the glades of the forest, or blew in gusts between the aisles of its myriad trees. After a few moments, I set forth along the path on the two-mile walk back to Kampekurai. Now, this path varies in width according to the nature of the soil and the character of the vegetation, from fifteen feet at the maximum to hardly a yard. At certain points it is fringed with long grass, and at other places by lantana undergrowth. Several small streams have to be crossed, where bamboos grow in profusion, their tall, swaying stems creaking to the gentle breeze, while the fronds, in obliterating the moonlight, cast ghostly, checkered patterns on the ground in front. In such circumstances, your heart thumps in your chest almost audibly and as if to leap from its cage. Your nerves are frayed to breaking point, 
and every faint rustle heralds the man-eater's charge. The inclination is to hurry, if not break into a run. Your nerves signal you to look to one side or the other, for the tiger may be making an attack from behind or from either side. All these emotions must be held under close restraint, for to give way to them in the least would mean panic, and panic will cause you to lose your presence of mind with ultimate but certain destruction to follow. The thing to make certain of is that the tiger is not in front, lying in ambush till you come abreast of him. To attack from the rear, he has to make at least some noise in the undergrowth in order to catch up with your normal stride as you walk forward. It is wisest, therefore, to look in front, although your eyes must search every shadow before you come abreast of it, rather than keep turning the head from side to side. Keep your rifle cocked and held in the crook of your arm, for you will have to fire from your hip and make certain of your shot. There will be no time to raise the rifle to your shoulder and aim, for the tiger is a killer, and it is not the habit of killers, either human or animal, to go about advertising their presence. For if they did, they would soon cease to be killers and become the killed instead. If your quarry is wounded, you may perhaps hear a snarl or growl, but most likely that unnervingly awful, earth-shaking woof as he charges. If he is not wounded and a man-eater, you may expect to hear just nothing, for he will be upon you in the twinkling of an eye. Hardly a quarter of a mile before Kempekarai, there is a low outcrop of boulders on both sides of the path. This is the most dangerous spot in the journey home, as the tiger could be behind any one of those boulders. However, seeing him head the other way when he made off, I felt he had not had enough time to retrace his steps. With this mental assurance, I negotiated the rocks and soon came to Kempekarai and my tent. Ranga and Baira were awake, as they always remained when I went out alone, in case I should require their sudden assistance. Telling them to make a fire and heat some water, I drank some coffee that had been kept ready, and got out my hypodermic syringe, which I sterilized in the hot water. Thereafter, mixing two phials of procaine penicillin, I gave myself a shot with the syringe. I got Ranga and Baira to wash the wounds with a strong solution of potassium permanganate, dissolved in the rest of the hot water, followed by a dressing of sulfonamide ointment. The spot was one that could not be bandaged or plastered, so I went to sleep, hoping that no ill effects would develop with my wounds. I was tired after my sleepless nights, and it was nearly nine o'clock before I awoke next morning. This is a very late hour for rising in any jungle where one is usually up and out before sunrise. The wounds, I was glad to note, were not unduly painful. Taking another dose of penicillin, and after redressing the wounds, I breakfasted excellently on porridge, bacon and eggs, and an enormously large ripe papaya fruit from the grove by the wellside where I had spent the first night. Then I set off to visit my bait on the stream bed, which I found as alive and well as on the previous morning. Returning the two miles up the path to where I had sat the previous night, I found the tiger had not come back, nor touched the bullock he had killed two nights before. His pug marks, as he had approached the tree, identified him as the tiger whose prince I had seen first. The forests of Salem, unlike those of the Nilgiris, Coimbatore and Chittur districts, are mostly thorny in nature, lantana and the weight a bit thorn predominating. Along the valleys and stream beds, these give way to clumps of bamboo. In either case, the effect is the same, namely to make roaming or stalking unprofitable, if not impossible. A carnivore moves silently, and the secret of its success as a hunter lies in the animal instinctively watching where it places its front paw in order to make no sound. Next, it places its rear paw in exactly the same spot as the front paw moves forward again to take the next step. The human stalker must move silently too. He must watch carefully where he places each step, for the smallest dry leaf will crackle when trodden upon, the smallest twig will snap. Those clutching wait-a-bit thorns must be avoided too, for a single thorn is strong enough to halt your progress if it catches in any part of your clothing 
while it will rip your flesh in no uncertain manner if you are foolish enough to wear shorts. All this will distract your attention from being on the lookout for the tiger, and if that tiger is a man-eater who will not be deterred by thorns, you are at a distinct disadvantage. The jungle at this spot was extremely thorny, so we returned to Kampekarai to hold a council of war with the grey beards of the village. The facts, as far as we now knew them, showed that the man-eater was a male of average size. He particularly frequented the path on the western range. He did not particularly care for bullock meat. We were still uncertain whether or not there was a second tiger in the vicinity. The obvious conclusion reached after this discussion was much the same as that reached by Ranga, Baira, and myself on the first day we had come to Kampekarai. Either await the next human kill, or offer a human live bait, preferably somewhere along the pathway to Kampekarai as it descends the western ridge. A couple of bullocks could also be tied out elsewhere in the jungle to tempt the man-eater, but more to find out if there was another tiger operating in the same area. The scratches which the tiger had inflicted being located where they were made it impossible for me to sit still for more than fifteen minutes at a stretch. This fact precluded all chances of sitting up in the literal meaning of the word. True, if I was to act as a bait, there would be no necessity for me to sit still. In fact, movement would be a necessary factor in helping to attract the tiger. On the other hand, the very act of sitting would not only be agonizing, but would also retard the healing of the wounds, which I was naturally anxious to hasten. The alternatives left were either to stand or lie down. The former course was naturally inadvisable for a night-long vigil, so the only practical method under the circumstances was to lie down. We did a lot of thinking that day, and eventually came by what we all thought to be a very ingenious plan. How ingenious it actually turned out, or rather did not turn out to be, you will very soon come to know. I have already explained that the footpath down the western range to Kampekarai was crossed at several places by streamlets, bordered by dense undergrowth and clumps of bamboo. The beds of these small rivulets were rocky and admirably suited the purpose I had in mind. It so happened that the first of these small streams to be crossed on the way down to Kampekarai from the tree on which I had sat the night before, was the broadest of the lot, and was, moreover, closely covered with rounded boulders of all size. My plan was to detach a cartwheel from one of the only two bullock carts in the village of Kampekarai, dig a pit in the stream bed, get inside it, place the wheel above, and anchor it securely around the circumference with big boulders. Smaller boulders and a camouflage of dry leaves would help to conceal the cartwheel. I would also make a human dummy and seat it somewhere on the footpath where it crossed the stream. The cartwheel would be raised off the ground at one end, facing the dummy to allow me a range of fire in that direction. This was my general plan. For the benefit of those who have not been to India, I would explain that the wheel of an Indian bullock cart, I am referring to the large type of cart, averages five feet in diameter. The circumference is of wood, some six inches wide by three inches thick, shod with hoop iron to serve as a tire. There are a dozen stout wooden spokes, all converging on a massive central wooden hub. The central hole in the wooden hub rotates around an iron axle, some one and a half inches thick. The wheel is kept from falling off by a cotter pin in the form of a flat iron nail passing through the axle at its outer extremity. Similarly, the wheel is prevented from moving towards the frame of the cart by the axle itself, which is made suddenly thicker immediately beyond the bearing surface of the axle on the hub, which is perhaps a little over a foot in width. In what may be called deluxe models, a better bearing surface is provided by lining the hole in the wooden hub with a piece of iron or galvanized piping. High-grade lubrication, from the village point of view, is provided by applying old motor oil, perhaps once a fortnight, on the ends of the axle, after removing the cotter pin and the wheel to do so. The oil is carried permanently on the cart in the shell of an old bullock horn, suspended somewhere beneath the cart, 
and is applied to the axle at the end of any piece of stick that may happen to be lying handy when servicing time comes up. It was too late to set the cartwheel that day, so we busied ourselves gathering old clothing from the villagers. Pants are unknown in such parts, so I contributed a pair of my own pants into which we stuffed two legs made of bamboo and wound around with straw. In case the pants might strike the tiger as being unfamiliar, we draped a dhoti, which is a cross between a sarong and a loin cloth, over the pants. The body of the dummy consisted of straw rammed into an old gunny sack, over which we draped a couple of torn shirts and a very ragged coat. The head of the dummy was a work of art. It was made from a large-sized, mature coconut, complete with its coir fiber. On dress occasions, Indian women sometimes augment their natural hair with false hair, which they twist into a bun or kunde behind their heads into which they stick flowers, particularly jasmine. Fortunately, there was a bell in Kampekarai who was vain enough to be the owner of a coil of such hair. This we borrowed, combed out, and fixed around the coconut to emulate the long hair of a villager. An untidily tied, yokel pattern, turban, was then wound around the nut and a pair of chappals, or sandals, were put on the dummy's feet. Tigers, as I have said, have no sense of smell, so the dummy looked realistic enough to attract a man-eater, if only he did not watch it long enough to begin wondering at its uncanny stillness. That night I applied fresh dressing to my wounds, and next morning helped myself to another shot of penicillin. I was thankful to note that so far no undue inflammation had occurred. By 8 a.m., half a dozen willing helpers and myself had trundled the cartwheel to the crossing I had in mind. Here we busied ourselves excavating a hole nearly four feet across by about four feet deep. This was easily done, for we were digging in the soft sand of a stream bed. Some grass was then cut and thrown into the hole to absorb, to some degree, the dampness of the sand which naturally increased with the digging of the hole. Sitting inside, I found I could adopt only a semi-crouched position, which was going to be very uncomfortable indeed, the only recommendation it offered being that it saved me from a sitting position, which, as I have said already, would have been most uncomfortable in view of my recent wounds. The dummy was placed with its back to a tamarind tree, some fifteen feet away, which stood on the western bank of the stream, where it was crossed by the track to Kampekarai. It was so arranged that its legs stuck out on the track at an angle of forty-five degrees. Thus, it would at once be visible to the tiger from any point along the stream bed or on either section of the track, if he happened to pass in any of those directions. Lastly, we collected some of the larger boulders, and as I stood guard with my rifle, Ranga and Baira gathered brushwood and debris for camouflaging the wheel. When eventually I got into the hole, the wheel was just a couple of inches above the top of my head. There was a space of six inches between the ground level and the wheel through which I could fire in the direction of the dummy. It was made by placing two stones of that size about three feet apart under the circumference of the wheel. The rest of the wheel was anchored to the ground by large boulders heaped up around the circumference, leaving the central portion open to the sky for purpose of ventilation. Brushwood and debris were scattered and intertwined among the boulders, and behind me to give a natural appearance to things so that the tiger would not become suspicious of the heaped-up boulders. It would also give me warning if he came up from behind when the debris would crackle as he brushed against it or trod on it. For safety's sake, I had arranged that the men should return to Kampekarai in a body, and only come back next morning again in a body. I would be imprisoned all night in the hole, as the weight of the cartwheel with the boulders above it was too great for me to lift unaided from inside. It was 4.30 p.m. when I entered my voluntary prison. It had taken nearly another half hour to position the boulders on the wheel and arrange the camouflage so that it was almost five when I found myself alone. The heat inside the hole, despite the opening above, was stifling. I removed my coat and shirt, and would have removed the remainder of my clothes, 
but for the fact that I did not want the sand to get into my wounds. Peeping above the level of the ground, I could clearly distinguish the dummy and quite a wide extent of the background. A clump of henna bushes grew halfway down the sloping bank behind the dummy. A slight movement in that direction caught my eye, which I found was due to the twitching, outstretched ear of a beautiful spotted stag that gazed in curiosity at the motionless dummy. The value of sitting still in a forest was then made apparent to me, for the stag gazed a full ten minutes at that still dummy. Then it appeared to lose interest in the curious object, and came out onto the open track, which it eventually crossed, vanishing into the jungle on the other side. The distance between the dummy and the stag could not have been much more than twenty feet, and yet the latter was quite unalarmed. Had a human been seated in place of the dummy, he would surely have moved, even if it was an eyelid that flickered, and this would have sent the stag crashing away in alarm. A pair of peafowl then came strutting along the track. The cockbird stopped, fanned out his tail, and rustled the quills in display to his admiring spouse. Female-like, she kept one eye on him and the other elsewhere. Anyway, she saw the dummy, took a short run, and sailed into the air. The cock, chagrined at her failure to appreciate his beauty, lowered his tail and saw the dummy too. A much heavier bird than the hen, he flapped wildly and desperately in an effort to take off, his wings beating loudly on the still evening air, before he finally managed to rise just clear of the surrounding bushes and follow his more wary partner to apparent safety. <coughs> Crowed the grey jungle cocks in all directions, as they came out along the stream bed to peck a few morsels before darkness fell. cackled the smaller spurfowl, belligerent little birds, as male fought male in little duels throughout the jungle for the favor of an accompanying hen, drab and uninteresting as she looks, to gain her favor was for them the only interest in the world that evening. Darkness fell to the farewell call of the pair of peafowl as they roosted for the night on some tall tree in the forest, perhaps a quarter of a mile away. They cried as the sun sank behind the western range. Those of you who have been in an Indian forest will remember the almost miraculous switchover that takes place at sunset as the birds of the daylight hours cease their calls and the birds of the night take their place. Cried the night jars as with widespread wings they sailed overhead in search of insect morsels or settled on the ground resembling stones against a background of sand. It was pitch dark where I sat, and even the dummy was hidden under the shadows of the tamarind tree beneath which it was propped. I reckoned the moonlight would not reach that spot till after ten o'clock. At nine I heard the noisy snuffing and deep-throated gurgle of a sloth bear as it wended its clumsy way down the stream in my direction. It almost fell over the outlying debris we had placed on the stream bed to give me warning of the tiger's approach, and then saw the newly heaped boulders placed upon the cartwheel. I could have read the thoughts that crossed the little brain beneath the shaggy black hair. Here's a chance to find some luscious fat grubs, or a beetle or two, perhaps a nest of white ants, or, most hopeful of all, a beehive built by the small yellow bees that can hardly sting a big bear like me. With those thoughts, the bear fell to work on the task of clearing away the boulders that so carefully anchored my cartwheel. Shoo! I whispered in an undertone. Get away, you interfering! The bear heard my voice and stopped. Where did that come from? He was thinking. A few minutes silence followed and then he started on the stones again. Out! Shoo! I whispered. The bear stopped climbed over the boulders and looked down between the spokes at me. Arr, arr, he growled. Get out, you idiot, I growled. Roof, 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 he answered, as he scrambled, helter-skelter, over the boulders, stumbled over the debris, scampered up the bank and crashed away between the dried bamboos. 
Hardly ten minutes had passed after the bear's noisy departure when I heard the most infinitesimal of noises, the soft tread of the padded foot of some heavy animal. It is almost impossible to imitate that noise in speech and less so on paper. The nearest description I can give is the very muffled impact of a soft cushion when it is thrown onto a sofa. The tiger had come, and in his silent way was negotiating the fringe of the debris we had scattered on the stream bed behind me. He was picking his way carefully across it. Would he attack the dummy? Would he pass in front of me? These were the questions that raced through my mind as I awaited developments. My nerves were taut with anticipation. The moon had already risen, but its beams had not yet reached the shadows cast by the heavy foliage of the tamarind tree. The dummy was not visible to me, but I knew the tiger could clearly see it. There was silence for a time. How long, I could not say. Then came the clink of a stone as it rolled above my head. Nobody had anticipated an attack in that direction, but my recent visitor, the bear, had already shown that the unexpected could happen. Now the unexpected was being repeated by the presence of the tiger above me. What had caused it to ignore the dummy? and come straight to the spot where I lay was a mystery. Very likely, the tiger had been watching the bear, had seen its strange behavior, had noted its hurried departure, and had come to investigate. Even more likely, the behavior of the bear had caused the tiger to suspect human agency which he had come over to find out for himself. Or perhaps the wheel just happened to be situated on the shortest line of approach which the tiger was following to get at the dummy. Whatever the reason, the tiger was now barely two yards away and above me. As these thoughts raced through my mind, I heard the vague sound caused by the tiger's breathing. Then he stepped gracefully over one of the big boulders that held down the wheel and peered down at me. In the meantime, I had not been idle. Screwing myself around as best as I could, I now lay half on my back, gazing up at the tiger. The rifle I had drawn inwards and backwards till the butt came up against the side of the hole. I have already told you this hole was about four feet across and about the same in depth. Hence, it was impossible to get the rifle to point completely upwards. The most I could manage was an angle of a little more than sixty degrees with the bottom of the hole. Unfortunately, the tiger was not in the direction in which the muzzle was pointing but was standing behind it and directly above the spot where the butt of my rifle was stuck against the side of the hole. Then events moved quickly. The tiger did not react quite as the bear had done. His features, dimly visible above me, contorted into a hideous snarl. A succession of deep-throated growls issued from his cavernous chest, and, lying down upon the cartwheel, he attempted to rake me with the claws of a foreleg which he inserted between the spokes of the wheel. I knew those talons would rip my face and head to ribbons if they only made contact. So, sinking as low into the hole as possible, I struggled desperately to turn the muzzle of the rifle towards the tiger. All this took only seconds to happen. The tiger growled and came a little farther onto the wheel. The muzzle of my rifle contacted his shoulder and I pressed the trigger. The explosion within that confined space was deafening. The tiger roared hideously as he catapulted backwards. During the next thirty seconds, he bit the boulders, the wheel, and even the sand as he gave forth roar after roar of agony. Then I heard him fall amidst the debris, pick himself up, fall again, get up, and finally crash into the bushes that bordered the little stream. He was still roaring and continued to do so for quite fifteen minutes more as he staggered away into the jungle. Finally, silence, total and abysmal, fell over the forest. After the pandemonium that had just reigned, every creature, including the insects, decided it was wise to hide till with the passage of time they could forget their fright. The hours passed. At one in the morning, a stiff breeze began to blow over the hills. Dark storm clouds scudded across the sky, completely hiding the moon, and soon the distant sound of falling rain across the western range fell upon my listening ear. Not long afterwards, large raindrops penetrated between the spokes and splashed down upon me. Then the deluge began. 
such as can only be experienced in tropical countries, and particularly forest regions with dense vegetation. I was soaked to the skin, and the water began to trickle down the sides of the hole. With that came the sudden realization that the stream, which had been dry, would soon be flowing with the spate of rainwater that was running into it from all directions, along a hundred tributaries. I would be drowned like a rat in a hole. Jerked into frenzied action, I got on my hands and knees, placed my back to the wheel, and pressed upwards with all my might. The wheel did not budge an inch. My helpers had done their work of protecting me from the tiger only too well. They had placed the heaviest boulders they could find around the circumference of the wheel, and I was unable to move them unaided. There was but one chance left, and that was to dig myself through the six-inch wide gap we had made for me to fire through. Desperately, with both hands, I scooped the earth downwards into the hole, which was already half-filled with water and sand. The damp sides were collapsing, making it very obvious that, within the next few minutes, unless I got out quickly, cartwheel and boulders would all come down together on top of me. When I judged there was sufficient room for my body to pass, I pushed the rifle between the spokes of the wheel and then rested it across them. Next, I started squeezing myself through the opening I had just dug, wriggling in the sand and water like a stranded eel, till I finally struggled free onto the stream bed. The rain continued to fall in torrents. I had no idea how far the tiger had gone, or in which direction, so picking up the rifle, I first carried the dummy off the stream bed and placed it high up on the western bank. Then I started to recross the stream on the return journey to Kambekarai, and as I did so, I heard the dull roar of the spate of rainwater descending the stream bed from the direction of the hills. Within a few minutes it arrived, a wall of foaming water over three feet high, carrying all before it, logs of wood, uprooted trees, dead bamboos, and flotsam and jetsam of every description mingled with the crested, frothing waters. They reached the cartwheel and covered it. Then cartwheel and boulders were swept away downstream along with the torrent. In less than five minutes, the stream had become a raging river over four feet deep. Thankfully, appreciating the escape I had had, I began the return journey to Kampekarai. No other sound could possibly be heard above the patter and swish of the rain. The darkness was intense, my torch throwing a circle of light before me. Moreover, the ground was extremely slippery to the soft rubber shoes that I was wearing. I had to cross three other streams, slightly smaller than the one where I had sat, but all were raging torrents of water. Halfway to Kampekarai, I saw the flicker of an approaching light. A little later, I met the party of men that were carrying it, Ranga, Baira, and a few stalwarts from the village. They had realized the danger I was in when the waters rose and had risked encounter with the man-eater to come to my rescue. Next morning, the sun shone brightly on the saturated forest. We returned to the site of my adventure the night before. All streams were flowing briskly, although they were now no more than two feet deep. There was no trace of the cartwheel anywhere near the crossing. Evidently, it had been borne downstream by the spade and probably smashed to bits. We combed both banks thereafter without finding any signs of the tiger. The torrential rain had only too effectively obliterated any blood trail or pug marks. Two hours later, a depressed and disappointed group we returned to Kampekarai. There I remained for three more days, hoping to hear news of the tiger, only to be doomed to disappointment. Both Baira and Ranga felt it had died of its wounds, but I doubted this very much, as I knew I had not been able to aim sufficiently well to score more than a mere raking shot. My period of leave, taken for the purpose of shooting this animal, had now elapsed so I left Kempegarai on the morning of the fourth day, instructing Ranga to remain behind to assist Baira in reconnoitering. They were then to come to Penagram and thence to Dharmapuri, where there was a telegraph office from which they could send me a message. They were to await my reply there. Ten days after returning to Bangalore, the hoped-for telegram arrived, stating that a pack pony belonging to a forest guard of the Kodikarai Forest Lodge had been killed. 
Calculating from the telegram that the kill would be four days old by the time I reached it, I sent a reply, telling my henchmen to return to Kempekarai and wait there for any further events, which were to be reported by telegram in the same way. Six more days passed when I received a second telegram stating that a tiger had attacked the driver of a bullock cart that was the last of a convoy traveling from the small hamlet of Murappur towards Sopathi on the Chinar River. This, no doubt, was the man-eater again. Within an hour, I was on my way by car to Dharmapuri, where I picked up my two henchmen. We continued to Penagram, where we left the car and made a cross-country trip of about 12 miles to Marappur, passing the Chinar River and Sopathi on the way. I had, meanwhile, learned that the cartman, who had been attacked by the tiger, had saved his life by jumping from the cart in which he was travelling onto the yoke and then between the two bulls that were hauling his cart. He had yelled vociferously, and his yells were taken out by the other cartmen in the convoy. The tiger had then made off. I spoke to this cartman at Murappur. He said that the tiger had suddenly appeared behind his cart, which was the last in the line, and had attempted to leap into it from the rear, when he had dived between his bulls for protection, asking him why the tiger had not succeeded in the comparatively easy task of getting into the cart, the man said it had jumped half in and he had not waited to see any more. Meanwhile, a party of travellers who had followed us from Sopathi brought the news that they had come across fresh tiger pug marks made the previous night leading down the Chinar River. Hearing this, we hurried back to Sopathi, nor did it take us long to find the pug marks. The water was running in the Chinar as a silvery stream, meandering from bank to bank, and in the soft, wet sand we clearly noticed that the tiger which had made the marks must have been limping badly. The weight of the body fell almost entirely on the left forefoot, the right being placed very lightly on the sand at each step. I have said that Spider Valley met the Chinar River at this spot. A half mile downstream, and in the direction in which the tiger had gone, was a small longish rock in midstream. It rose some four feet above the bed of the river, and was about forty feet long by eight feet wide. I decided to sit on top of that rock that night, in the hope the tiger might make his way back up the Chinar and see me in my elevated position. Borrowing Ranga's turban, old brown coat, and dhoti, I donned all three, the two latter above my own clothing, and seated myself on the rock by 5.30 p.m. As Ranga and Baira were afraid to return to Murappur alone, they elected to spend the night on comfortable crotches, high up in the huge mutti trees that border the Chinar in this locality. The nights were dark at this time, but from my position on the rock, and as the Chinar was about 100 yards wide at this spot, I relied upon the white sand to reflect the starlight and to reveal the form of the tiger from whatever direction it might come. Apart from being handicapped by its lameness, I knew the tiger would not charge its prey from a distance of 50 yards, but would try to stalk as close to me as possible before launching the final attack. After testing my lighting equipment, I carefully loaded and cocked the point four zero five, which I laid on the rock to my right, where it could not be seen by the tiger and create suspicion. I had also taken the precaution of bringing my point twelve bore double barrel Jeffreys with me as a spare weapon. With LG slugs in the choke barrel and lethal ball in the right, I laid the Jeffreys on the rock to my left. My flask of tea some chapatis to satisfy my hunger towards morning, and my pipe completed my creature wants for the night. I sat on my great coat, for the cushion it provided against that hard rock. I would wear it if the night should become too cold. The usual animal and bird calls from the forest bade farewell to the day, while the denizens of the night welcomed their turn of activity with their less melodious and more eerie cries. At 7.30 it was dark. The reflecting whiteness of the sands of the Chinar surrounded my rock as if it were an island. Just after nine there was a loud bustling and crashing, and a tusker came down the bank, walked along the sands, passed the rock where I sat motionless, and continued beyond. There he met 
the current of breeze blowing down the river, and caught scent of me. Banging the end of his trunk against the ground, and emitting a peculiar sound, as if a sheet of zinc were being rapidly bent in half, he turned around, smelled more of me, and hurried up the bank into the cover of the thick undergrowth that grew there. Such is the behavior of an elephant when it is not a rogue. At eleven, I was still keeping my watch in all directions, as I had been doing since sunset. Then, half to the rear and my left, I sensed rather than saw a movement. Looking more intently, I could see nothing. No, wait, was that not a blur against the faint, grayish-white carpet of river sand? I looked away and then back again at the spot where I had just noticed the blur. It was not there. That's funny, I thought. Are my eyes playing tricks or are they just becoming tired? Staring hard, I saw it again, only it was much closer to me this time than when I had seen it first. Indeed, it was halfway between the further bank and the rock on which I sat. I could not now risk looking in any other direction until I succeeded in defining this strange object, and as I looked it seemed to stretch, to float towards me, growing longer and shorter at intervals, but making no sound whatsoever. Then, in a flash, I realized what it was. The tiger was crawling towards me on his belly, silently, in quick, short motions, till he judged he was within range to make his final murderous assault. Perspiration poured down my face and neck. I trembled with terror and excitement. But this would not do. So taking a deep breath and holding it to allay the trembling, I offered a silent prayer to my maker and drew the rifle onto my lap, raising it to my shoulder. The tiger, now some twenty yards away, saw my movement and seemed to guess that his presence had been discovered. A thin black streak, his tail, moved behind him. The blur became compact as he gathered himself for the charge. My torch beam fell full on his snarling, flattened head. Then the rifle spoke, a split second before he sprang. With my bullet he rose and bounded forward. I owe my life to the fact that the torch did not go out, and I was able to fire a second shot. Then he had reached the rock. Because of his earlier wound, or my recent shots, at that moment I could not tell which, he failed to climb up. My third bullet, fired at point-blank range, through the crown of his skull, stopped the charge that had all but succeeded in reaching me, and he rolled back onto the sands of the Chinar, his career at an end. Whistling on my way back to Sopathi, I gathered Ranga and Baira from the Muthi trees on which they were sitting. Hearing my shots and seeing my approach along the riverbed, they gathered I had killed the tiger. Next morning we found him to be an average-sized, somewhat thin male. My shot from beneath the cartwheel, fired seventeen days earlier, had done more damage than I had thought for it had passed through his right shoulder, splintering the bone, and out again. But the wound was in good condition, and I have little doubt would eventually have healed, although the tiger would have remained a cripple. My first shot of the night before had passed through his open mouth, and out through the neck, blowing a gaping hole. Still he had come on. The second shot had gone high, entering behind the left shoulder, passing downward through the lungs, and out again. And still he had come on. It was only my last shot through the crown of his skull that had shattered the brain that impelled his indomitable spirit. What had made this tiger a man-eater? This is the riddle that every hunter tries to solve when he kills a man-eater, be it a tiger or panther, not only for his own information, but for the education of the general public. And this beast proved to be no exception to the invariable rule that it is the human race itself that causes a tiger to become a man-eater. It had an old bullet wound in the same leg, the right, as had been injured by me in our first encounter, only lower down. Embedded in the elbow joint was a flattened lead ball, fired from some musket or gun a year or more earlier. This foreign body, embedded in the most important joint, had not only caused the tiger to suffer intense agony, but had greatly impeded his movements when it came to killing his legitimate food, wild game and cattle. 
it had weakened the use of the right leg, which plays an all-important part in gripping and pulling down his normal prey. Without a doubt, this was the sole factor that forced this tiger to turn to human beings as food in order to keep himself from starving. The End